everyone. Thank you for watching. Today I'm with the legendary boxing trainer, Tony Borg, who has trained a who's who list of professional boxers at a very high level over his career, including Lee Selby, IBF featherweight world champion, formerly, and Gary Buckland, the British super featherweight champion, as well as many, many others uh, over an amazing career. So today we are going to be having a chat about Tony's life and career. Uh, so, Tony, once again, thank you for um, having a chat with me today. I do appreciate that very much. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So I think it's a good place to start, really, um, because, I mean, over, over the years, you've trained so many uh, big names, you know, I mean, so many talented fighters, uh, you know, at, at every level from, you know, Olympic medalists and Commonwealth medalists to obviously world champions, British, European. I mean, you, you know, you've done a bit of everything. Can we talk a little bit about some of um, the people that you've you've trained um, over the years? And I know there's probably more than you can remember. We'd be here all day, uh, but let's talk about just a few of the of the key key successes that you've had in training. Okay, um, Matthew Edmonds was one of the first uh, successes I had at the British and well, well, Welsh and British level. Um, he boxed at two Commonwealth Games, one in Manchester and one in Australia. Also, Mo Nazir, who won the Commonwealth Gold medal at the boxing tournament, not the Gonmo Games. Um, so that's Matthew Edmonds, Mona Zia. Um, I've also trained Fred Evans, who won Olympic silver. Uh, Sean McGoldrick, who won Commonwealth gold. Andrew Selby, who's got an amazing record at um, all levels all around the world. Um, and, you know, they've all did exceptionally well in the amateur game and then later turned pro. Um, after then, then in the pro, pro side of it, I had uh, success with um, from Bobby Turley, Frankie Borg, Justin Few winning Welsh titles, um, Lee Churcher gaining Welsh title. Moving on then with uh, Gary Buckland, Lee Selby, Craig Evans, who've all gone up to uh, British and European level. Lee Selby, exception again, um, World Devil, and also Jamie Cox. And if any of the boxers out, any boxers out there have any injuries, they can give us a ring. And we've got the CBD Boxers Bar now available. It's normally £20, £15 on offer at the moment. Um, and it's, it's excellent, absolutely excellent for uh, repairing um, injuries to, uh, you know, the muscles um, immediately. Like, you know, it's, it's a really quick um, repair system. Like, you know, it really is working really well. It was twenty was twenty pounds, which used to offer at the moment the fifteen pounds time, and it's perfect for both sports and non-sports people. And the benefits are very quick repair to the muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Um, repairs them as soon as uh, two to three days. It's full spectrum CBD infused into a cream to give instant relief. You know, you've seen all these successes with fighters, and you've um, obviously been a pivotal um, key part of their success. I mean, that goes without saying. I mean, is there a particular moment that's like the proudest moment um, out, of your, out of your coaching career so far? Is there just one? Is there more than one? Or Yeah, there's, there's obviously uh, quite a few, actually. Yeah. Um, one of the best moments, um, small, you know, small hall shows, low-key, but Frankie Borg um, retaining the Welsh middleweight title against Kelly Hope and Murtha was a great moment for me. I really, it was a great fight. The crowd loved it. Um, it was a great atmosphere. Um, seemed like it was going to be a bit volatile at first, but everything, it was just respect at the end. Like, you know, a great fight. Seen two great fighters at Welsh level. So I was, that was a great moment for me. Um, the best week of my life was September 2011, when uh, Lee Selby won the British and Commonwealth title on a Saturday. And the following Saturday, Gary Buckland won the British title. So overnight, I had two champions, like, you know, so that was a uh, great week for me. Um, best night of all, obviously, is uh, Lee Selby boxing to perfection when he dismantled the uh, former European sensation, uh, sorry, former unbeaten sensation, Evgeny Granovich. Lee was cool and calculated, did a great job on a great champion, and it was a great, great performance. Fantastic. And obviously, Tony, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to touch on, I was going to touch on later, but we'll, we'll talk about it now, actually, is obviously, you know, you've been all over with your boxing career. And what I mean by that is actual fight locations, 
um, you know, you, you've been many, many places with fights. I mean, is there a favourite place that the boxing has taken you, whether it's in the UK, whether it's abroad? I mean, is there, is there anywhere that you really, really like that, that comes to mind? Immediately, it'd definitely be ab- um, at home. Um, I've heard the, the old 2 has been a great, uh, successful place for us. We had a lot of success there with Lee Selby. And obviously, I love boxing in Wales, so um, any shows that are down here, down here in Wales are great. And um, overall, in Great Britain, it'd be uh, the O2. Yeah, I mean, it is always an amazing atmosphere at the O2. I, I, I agree there, uh, definitely. Now, something else to sort of touch on. I mean, a lot of people will know, you know, how you originally got into coaching. Um, and, I, and I know that is sort of out there, and it's, it's out there in your book. But I would like to touch on it a little bit for, for maybe anyone watching this who doesn't know um, actually, actually, how you got started? Because obviously, you had your own um, boxing career, you had twenty-four fights, um, and everything like that. And then you moved into coaching. I mean, I, I personally, I know more of the story. But for anyone who doesn't, can we touch on that a little bit about how you first got into actually coaching, training for fighters? Yeah, I, um, I had an accident. Um, well, firstly, if we start at the beginning, I, I went to court. I got into trouble for um, an assault charge. I had a fight in Cardiff with somebody. Um, they got injured, took me to court, and I got found guilty of assault. I left the courtroom, I think it was about 2.30 in the afternoon. I rang my trainer, Steve Sims, and uh, we arranged to go for a run. We were running about 5, 5.30, so it's literally hours later. A car came on the bend, missed Steve, swerved around Steve, and hit me. I went up in the air into the windscreens, onto the floor, snapped my leg, back injuries, head injuries. And for some unknown reason, the boxing board of control uh, put two and two together, two and two together, made five, and assumed that uh, it was the, the the car accident, the incident was connected to the uh, assault charge, like you know, and which it was nothing to do. It's a totally independent person on his own from work, Just come on the corner and hit me. That was it. That was it. Like you know. But as a result of the accident and then getting banned by the Boxing Board of Control, I got banned for, um, I think it was 18 months. Um, I was just uh, out on a limb, basically. I went straight back into the gym and started coaching. I did that for about a year, two years. I got, got fed up with, um, you know, boys letting me down or going away with going away as the opponent all the time and not, not getting a decision. I had too many fights where I knew we'd won the fight and we didn't get a decision. I thought... I'm not, I'm, not in the, I'm not in the sport for this. I'm not driving up and down the motorway to earn a couple of quid. You know, I wasn't interested in that. I, my, my, I wanted winners. I wanted, to be champ- I wanted to be a champion when I was fighting, and I wanted champions when I was training. So um, I took a backseat for a while of the training, had a look at myself and thought, right, I'll give it one more go. I made a comeback. I had three fights. One, two, lost one. Um, I lost the last one to Ross Hale. And uh, at the time, he was unbeaten. I think he got about 13, 113. And he went on to be British and Commonwealth champion. But at that stage in my life, I just thought, you know, I, I ain't playing second best to nobody. Like, you know, so I just uh, went straight back into the gym and uh, been coaching since. And uh, I've had a lot of success from, from Welsh level right through to world level. Inspirational, I suppose, for some people who, who've been in trouble. And I think it's the end of the world. Or, you know, they've got a bit, a bit into, I got into a bit of trouble. I went to prison. Um, um, I got done for an assault, assault on two, two occasions. I got banned from the boxing board of control. But I just stuck at it, kept going back there every month, trying to get a license, trying to get re licensed. And eventually they gave me a license. Um, a year or two later, I had my first world champion, and I had another world champion. Uh, Ten years down the line, I've got a British and Commonwealth champion and a British champion. Um, 14 years down the line, I'm top of the world with Lee Selby. You know, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, how it all comes together, like, you know. Just shows it can be done. You know, there's boys out there that, no matter how bad what situation you can be in, it could seem like the end of the world. But, um, you know, you can get, get back on track. Brilliant message. I've got to ask you then, Tony, since we're talking about it, I mean, the one thing, I mean, how did you not give up? Um, I mean, what? I mean, in that sense, I mean, what kept you going? Was it just a love for the sport, or was it? Did you, I mean, you obviously always believed that you'd get there. I'd like to say a love for the sport, but you know, I'd, I'd be lying. I was, um, I, I, I love to fight. 
you know, scrapping on the streets. I, I was you're always into that. I couldn't couldn't miss one now. If there's a fight outside my window now, I'd have to put this phone down and be out there. And I've been like that since I was a kid, so nothing's ever changed. And then I started playing dormant for pubs and clubs in Newport and Cardiff, mainly in Newport. Um, so I'm involved in it all the time. And in the one area of Newport, in Main D, I had, um, I think, seven pubs. So there'd be a problem in one pub, and they phoned me. Even though I had dormant there, they phoned me, we've got a bit of an issue. I'd have to go across there and go across. And I, I was in it all the time. And it got to a point where I, I, was, I was loving it. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up doing a bad one here. I just don't need this no more. I gotta get out of it. And um I just thought, well, I lost my license once already to a fight. One more, I'll have my license taken off me for good. So I just knocked the door work on the head and just just put everything into the boxing. Well this you know, just touching on something, Tony, that that I've um wanted to ask is, you know, one of one of the key questions here in that way is obviously having had you know, um, a lot of the fighting experiences that you've had as amateur professional uh, and a professional as well. Um, I've noticed, obviously, that you bring some of that into um, the training of your fighters. And where I'm going with that is, you know, you always sort of ensure they're very well prepared uh, and all these different things. I mean, so the question is, what lessons would you say you've brought, like, from your career into into your coaching, um, if that makes sense? Because it, it gives you a different perspective. I mean, it gives you, having fought yourself, it gives you a perspective on everything from you know, some of the corruption, some of the dodgy dealings to, like you say, getting decisions to obviously the training aspect, the mental preparation. I mean, so, so, so many things, and it's probably more than we can talk about here. But if, if there was a few key things that you sort of um, learned from your professional career that you, you apply to your training career, if that makes sense, what would they, what would they be? The first one was 100% be um, hydration. When, when I was in the gym and probably boxes a few years after me as well, and definitely years before, whenever you were looking to make weights, it was always the weight below. And you'd always, your trainer say to you, well, just go home now and just cut the fluids, dehydrate. And we all just, even as kids in the gym, I was there, 42 kilos, 45 kilos, you just dehydrate and cut weight to get to the weight below. And that was the case all the time, like, you know, and um, it's just the opposite. Now I just do the opposite in the gym. We wouldn't dare swallow drinks in our gym or take drinks into the, into the gym to consume as you just finish a session. But in our gym, they come to the gym with their drinks ready. Uh, they drink water all through the session. They, have, they, they stay hydrated at all times. So, um, yeah, hydration is a massive importance in um, boxing. That's good. That's a good, that's a good lesson, that is. Uh, absolutely. And the other thing, Tony, is, I mean, obviously, training all the people that you've trained, you know, always having a busy gym, you know, filled with, with champions at different levels and, and everything like that. Uh, I mean, again, I know the answer to this, but for the people watching, I mean, what sort of atmosphere do you sort of seek to create in the gym? Uh, and what I mean by that is obviously, I mean, you know this better than I do, but you've been into some gyms and, and it's sort of quite formal in there. And it's, do you know what I mean? In other gyms, it's the music playing, it's more banter and it's, do you know what I mean? It's more relaxed and stuff. I mean, what sort of um, atmosphere do you do you look to create in your gym? And, and also, how do you think that sort of impacts on, the fighters and on the training? Um, I like it to be sensible. Um, music in the background is fine. I wouldn't like it, don't like it playing and pumping, pumping like crazy, like, but um, just a bit of music in the background, um, warm, friendly atmosphere, and the boxers uh, mingling with each other, mixing with each other, good camaraderie with the boxers. I like to see them all training hard, pushing each other on. I like them to spar sensibly without. Um, any real bad feeling, proper, you know, good sensible sparring, helping each other out, um, uh, and just just mixing, just mixing, mixing as a as a group, as a team. Um, obviously, occasionally, quite often, we do get boxers from other gyms coming down to spare, and the same goes there. Like we I expect them to um, fall in line with the same sort of things that we're doing. Like you know, if there's any bad atmosphere with the sparring, or sparring gets a little bit you know, um, alienated, I'll just um, stop it, calm it down, and just say, listen, you know, we're here to help each other out. It's not a war. No one's getting paid for it. Let's just chill for a bit, like, you know? So, uh, yeah, good, good, sensible sparring and a good, friendly atmosphere. Okay. Which which does lead me into, um, obviously, your role as, as the trainer and everything like that. I mean, what sort of um, connection 
you know, would you say you, you have in fighters? So with that in mind, obviously, I know there's obviously the physical training, but you um, obviously really take an interest and guide, you know, aspects of their career, make sure they're making the right decisions. And personally, over time, I've, um, I've seen you, I'm trying to think how to put it, but I've seen you really advise them and really sort of go out of your way to um, look after their best interests, make sure they don't make certain mistakes, which, and I know, and I know that's part of your job, but it seems like it sort of goes beyond the job in some ways. So, and I know it's a sort of a strange question, but I mean, how would you define um, that aspect of, of your role, uh, if that makes sense? I tried to give them what I didn't have. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have a dad, for example. So I tried to get them to um, show a lot more um, appreciation to their parents, whether it be mum and dad or their uncle or an older brother. Um, who's running them around, taking them here, driving them places, um, selling tickets for them, etc. I had none of this. Um, if there's um, somebody else in, in, the, in the background in an advisory role, you know, um, strength and conditioning coach or former amateur trainer, or, you know, I always just try to get them to show them respect um, and not, not just for push them aside or ignore them, like, you know. Take on board every everything you, every every bit of help you can uh, get. Yeah, it's valuable. It's it's uh, yeah. I I do like the respect. Um, uh, well, yeah. I mean, I like the respect that you, I've always seen you encourage, Tony. And even though that's a little bit off topic and everything, but I just just saying that to you because I always like the respect I've seen you sort of instill, you know, in the gym um, and and very much. Let's talk about your let's talk about your books then because that's something else that I want to touch on um, is some of the publicity you've had. Um, over recent times. And let's, so let's start with the books. Obviously you've got two books in print, you've got Megan's Boy and you've got uh, Bog's Greatest Hits. Um, I've read them both, very, very good reads. Um, how does it feel to have your life story actually out there in print like that? Quite refreshing actually. It was, it was nice to sort of sit back and read the book. It, it, it was um, unreal, like, it was like, well, I'm, I'm reading about me and it was, it was strange to actually see it all there together and reading about it. Like, you know, obviously, I know all the experience I've been through. Um, I know the ups and downs of my life. What, you know what happened. But to actually sit there and read it, and um, you know, let, let it register that you, you're reading about myself was uh, really strange. It must be a good feeling, I'd imagine, um, in, in some ways. And then, obviously, you know, you, I mean, you were telling me earlier about the um, the different documentaries um, that you know, you've had made about yourself and everything and been on TV. Um, obviously, it must be nice to be recognised for your achievements, you, you know, in that way, I'd imagine. But what is the actual experience like um, of being involved in something like that, something as big as that, I mean, being on live TV, you know, having the, uh, you know, having the cameras on you? What's the whole experience like with, with that situation? Uh, if I'm honest, I, I enjoyed all of it. There's one or two little instances where maybe a cameraman's come to my house early, first thing in the morning, asked to film me coming down the stairs and getting on my bike or whatever. And I've gone outside and he said, oh, Tony, you had a red t-shirt on when you first come to the door. I said, right. He said, you got a blue t-shirt on. Oh, could, you, could you change back to the red t-shirt? Little things like that, like, you know, can you go back up the stairs again? Um, you know, or um, just for continuity, um, you had blue tracksuit bottoms on uh, earlier on. Can you just change back into those little things like that. I could have gone, oh, here we go, here we go. But on the whole, um, it was it was great. It was, it was really good. It's very enjoyable. And um, not just for myself, for my family as well. It's good. We enjoyed it. Good experience. Well, that's good, that's good to hear. That is good to hear. And I mean, talking about um, good experiences, um, the one thing I, I want to ask you is obviously being a trainer, you know, doing what you're doing and everything like that, I mean, what is your actual favourite part of it? And I know people uh, might have different opinions about this, but from your point of view, um, what part of it do you like best? Is it, is it the winning? Is it actually seeing people develop? Um, is, is it not more even, than one? Not even worth debating, it's just winning. It's all, it's not, nothing else touches it. Winning. You know, just, just winning is just such a, an amazing feeling. I was a winner as, a, as an amateur myself. I did exceptionally well. I had 115 fights, 105. Um, you know, I, I was a winner, and that's what I turned it pro boxing for to be a winner. I didn't win, didn't go in there to win one or lose one win. You know, I wasn't about that. Um, and at the same time, uh, don't get me wrong, I got 
a lot of respect, you know, respect for the journeyman, but um, I'm just not about that. I don't train journeymen. I, I'm not going up there to make the numbers up and get you a couple of quid and drive home. You know, I'm not, and if we can't win that fight, or if it's not a proper real fight, I wouldn't even bother with it. So I don't train, don't train any journeyman. All of my fighters are there to win. Now, there's another thing um, that I've sort of been leading to with some of this, that's maybe a bigger question. Um, so we'll see what happens with this. But having seen people um, make it to all different levels and having seen some people, you know, some of your boxers go, well, a lot of them go very, very far. But obviously some you've probably seen over the years, you know, not maybe fulfill their full potential and things like that. I mean, what would you say separates um, the, you know, the best from the rest, basically, for want of a better term. And what I mean by that is what, what separates, what is the championship uh, mentality in particular that, that you would say separates those who um, achieve everything they can achieve um, to those who don't, if that makes sense? What are some of the key well, things? Make no mistake, there are fighters out there um, who have a bit of the ability and probably the... Um, most parts to uh, go all the way to win British titles, but they're not, um, they don't sell tickets. They're not with the best promotional outfits. Might not be the best uh, coaching system. Might not be the best team, the best team around them. Um, but in the main, you know, if they can't sell tickets and nobody's come turning up to watch them fight, they're not gonna get the fights. They're not gonna make it to get the bricks. So there are fighters out there, but who, who end up being journeymen, not because of any particular reason, other than the fact that they can't really sell tickets themselves. So they just turn up and um, fight against the boys who are selling tickets. Yeah, yeah it, it obviously makes sense, you know, when you know the game. Yeah, but it's um, been a lot better than their records show. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've seen that many times. Um, which is something else that, you know, I've seen you sort of advising um, fighters on the, you know, on the business aspect in the past, um, which is something I think is, is a very special thing. It's a very good thing, to be honest, Tony. I've never seen um, other coaches doing that, and I'm sure some of them do. But it, it's nice that you advise your fighters on how to actually make money and how to actually do well, because obviously turning up and just being, a good, just being very good at the sport, you know, isn't, isn't enough, really. Um, yeah. You know, so I mean, that's not really a question. That's just that's just again a little bit off topic. It's something that uh, I, I think is, is a good thing. Well, I tell uh, boxers like, for example, uh, Joshua John, uh, lovely, lovely young kid, nice boxing. He's got some great, he's got some great tools, great footwork, and great, great, great movement. So I'm just saying to him, when you're up there in that ring, that's your platform. So if this show is on, on S4C, you've got an opportunity to have so many other people see what you can do. And you're not top of the bill, you're, you're bottom of the bill, you're the first fight on, whatever. They have people talking about you tomorrow. People talking in their local pubs about, who's that young kid from uh, Port Albert? Uh, Joshua John looks like a kid. It's a platform. So don't just go through the motions and get your little four round win. Show something a little bit different. Show a fantastic jab, fantastic head movements, and great hand speed. It's, like I say, it's a, it's a platform to uh, shine, isn't it? So that's why I tried to get all the boxes to shine on the platform they're given by. Chris Sanniger, for example, on his shows down here in Wales. When people come into the gym or, or when you're sort of looking for, for new talent and things like that, um, what sort of traits do you, do you look for? I mean, can you tell straight away that like someone's going to do well or does it sort of take a little bit of time? Do you have to sort of work with them for a bit? Um, I mean, how does, that, how does that work? If I'm honest, I, 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 you know, I, I don't go looking for talent. It's just uh, or any particular weight. Um, we have a steady flow coming in and it just seems to just naturally balance itself out. Like, you know, we have one or two lightweights that I don't want to be competing with each other. And then one moves on a little bit, one staggers a little bit, and then one catches up. So they're at a, just slightly different times. Like, you know, Lee Selby, now is right at the top of the of the world. You know, there for the overly for his uh, second world title, two different weights. And Gavin Gwynn's on the brink of winning the British title. So we've got two great lightweights in the gym. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily be Concerned if another lightweight came to me and wanted to, want to turn pro now, because he'd be um, a year or two behind them. I'm not, not really going to catch up, like, you know, it's going to be a se separate time. So um, I, look, I look at that. So I'm not, I wouldn't like to be in this position where I got two boxers in the same weight at the same period of their lives, aiming at the same, same titles. You know, I would, I would definitely avoid that.
on two fighters yeah. from my team boxing each other, you know. But look, um, anyone who comes to my gym, comes to a little trial first for a week or two, see how they work out. They might not like it themselves. They might find it too hard. They might find it too easy. They might not be happy with whatever situation it is. We train every morning at 11 o'clock and we come back about 6 or 6 for some of the others. Um, that might not fit in, fit in with them. But um, they've also got to fit in with what, you know, what I expect in the gym, like, you know. And they've got, to, yeah. um, they've got to be able to mix in a blend. Like, there's no bad feeling in our gym. All the boys get on well together. They come down together, sometimes three or four in one car, three or four in another car. Sometimes come separately. But they come together, they go for coffee later on. They often go for um, a food in the health hut uh, on the corner from us, where they have, um, you know, good balanced diet there. And they have a nice sensible meal. Uh, they meet up for to go to other shows to support each other. So that you know they really are it's a great it's a good team. So if you come to our gym, you've got to be part of that team. Another thing there is um, because uh, I think there's only a few more things now. But one of the ones I wanted to ask you is is obviously the mental side of fighting is um, obviously in some ways as you know important as as the physical training. Um, what would you sort of say about the mental side of boxing in that way? Because the reason I ask that is because it's often, I often feel it's sometimes a little bit overlooked uh, in some areas, but obviously people have got to believe in themselves. I mean, how do you handle it, say, if a fighter's nervous before a fight or if they've got certain things like that going on, or maybe they've got things in their lives that are, you know, they're not fully focused and some of the mental things that go on. How do you sort of, how do you work with that? The boxer told me they were nervous going into a fight. My immediate reaction would be, well, I'm glad you are. Because if you are not nervous going into a fight, something's wrong. You need to be nervous. That gets the adrenaline pump in. You need to be nervous. And if you're going in there, um, stone cold, not, not bothered, then it's time to pack it in, really. Like, you know, you need, you need to be nervous to, for a, of your opponent. It's not fear. You're not terrified of him. You're not fighting. You're going to get beat up. But you need to be, get that adrenaline pump in, like, you know? So um, I'd expect a boxer to be nervous. Um, on the other hand, though, there are things that, you know, a boxer can be training for eight to ten weeks training camp. Everything going well, the diet's going well, the sparring's going well, everything's, everything's you know, on track. 50-50 um, fight, could be a title fight or eliminator. And one little thing that morning or the day before, any time that week, a problem with his child, somebody's bumped his car, um, he's had a phone call that he's heard his girlfriend was out with some other bloke the other night. Any little thing like that, right? Can throw that eight weeks in the bin. And a boxer going in that ring, not right mentally, is a real worry, real problem. He could go in having missed three or four runs, could miss two or three sparring sessions, could have took his foot off the gas when he's punching the bags or doing the circuits. But if he's got a problem mentally, and often, they, if they have got a problem, they keep it to themselves. If they've got a problem like that, nine times out of ten, you're going to get beat. It's just too dangerous. You know, you can play football in a bad mood. You can, you can bump your car on a Wednesday. You still play football on Saturday. Not a problem. But going into a boxing ring with things like that on your mind, anything on your mind other than that, that opponent, I think is asking for trouble. So I like to keep open with the boxers. And if they've got problems, they've got issues, we can discuss them. Yeah, that's good. That's a very good, uh, you know, insight into that side of it. Um, now, there's one other thing, Tony, before, because in a minute now, I'd like to get to some future plans. But there is one other thing that's um, sort of a sort of looking back type question. Obviously, you mentioned earlier about, you know, wanting to give the boxers, you know, what you never had and, and sort of share your wealth of wisdom with them and everything like that. But and I'm going to ask about advice um, for young boxers. Now, I know you'd have a lot of advice. You'd have you know, more than we can share here. And obviously, if people want it, they should come to the gym, right? So that's fine. But just for the purposes of this, if there's like one, two, three things that are sort of someone just getting into the sport, someone maybe amateur, maybe just starting out, you know, just turning pro, just, just getting into it, what would you say to them? I mean, what advice would you give them that would be, you know, like absolutely essential, if that makes sense? Discipline is one, one of the most important things. If you, some people don't react very well to discipline. Um, even if they, they were just about to go for a run that day, you go to tell them to go for a run and 
they don't want them because you've told them. You know, some people are just like that, like you know, don't like discipline. And um, you you got to have it in this game. Um, it's really important. You need skill, nat- and natural ability, discipline, strength, stamina, a good diet, and in the pro game especially, you need a good following. You need people to buy tickets. You, you need people to appreciate your boxing and appreciate your boxing enough to buy a ticket to come watch your box. Because if nobody wants to come and watch your box, you ain't going to win any titles. You ain't going anywhere. You're just going to be a journeyman. If that's where you want to be, that's fine. But you've got to, you know, you've got to open your eyes and decide where, you, where you're going or where you want to go. That's good advice. That is good advice. Um, I, I do like how you bring fighters in with, you know, with their eyes open, so to speak. Do you know what I mean? Which is which is something I've seen many times, and it's you know it's it's, it's a good policy. Um, right. What was the next one? So let's talk about future plans a little bit, Tony. I mean, you know, let's talk about let's talk about um, you know what's ahead, what's on the horizon, and things like that. Because I know there's obviously there's some very big things happening at the gym. I know you can probably talk about some more than others, because um, I know how these things go. But I mean, even now over the next you know over the next couple of years or something like that. I mean, where Sort of, where do you see yourself? What are some of the future plans? Um, what's happening next, basically? Well, basically, we're going to open the gyms back up, get back on track. I got Gavin Gwynn in a British lightweight title fight, Lee Selby in eliminator for the world title, and he'd be to come Wales' first uh, two weight world champion. I got Jamie Cox making a comeback. I got Joshua John, Jordan Withers, and Lloyd Germain, young prospects, all unbeaten. All waiting to get in there. Lance Cooksey looking at the Welsh title fight at uh, Super Featherweight. Bobby Vernon looking at the Welsh title fight at Lightweight or Lightweight. So we're just knocking away at all the doors, everyone ready to go. Lee Selby, obviously, um, to the top of the world. Mm, brilliant. Tony, there's something else I'm going to ask that, that um, sort of came to me as we were talking, and it's, um, you know, it, it wasn't something I was originally going to ask you, but Obviously, you're, you know, you're very well known or, you know, pretty famous, really, for like your sense of humour and, you know, some of your some of your practical jokes over the years. Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, I can I can I can obviously remember a few, but um, I know there's a lot more. Um, and I mean, you know, that's something that that, um, like I say, that you're very well known for. I mean, where does the inspiration for that come from? And I've, I've heard I mean, obviously there's some stories in your book so people can read that. But I've seen everything from, you know, electric things on the hand to. Just, just even when you're with the boxers, just some of the jokes, and it, you know, there's a very funny, there's a very light atmosphere in the gym. Um, I mean, is that is is that just you, is or is that more for like publicity? I mean, what's the? No, what that, is that? That's, that is genuinely the way I am, and uh, I think I inherited it from my grandfather. It was a practical, practical joker all the time. I didn't have a dad. Spent a lot of time with my grandfather, and he was just um, always doing something to the point where he was like. Um, Bored and sadistic, like you know, you're just nuts, always doing just stupid things, like you know. Um, and I just followed on from that. I don't, um, I just see a, a funny side to most things I see. And whatever happens, whether there's an accident, a bump on your car, an argument in the street, a fight in the street, I see the funny side, it's there always. Um, it makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. I mean, it's it is a good uh, it's a good way. And I mean, go on then. I mean, over over the years, what do you have like a favorite um, practical joke? Is there a favorite situation? I mean, like I say, I know there's a few in your book, and I know there's a few you you, know, you might get in trouble for telling. But um, if there's any that that stick out, if not, I mean, they don't matter. But I just thought there might be something because um, obviously when I read your book, I to be honest, some of the stories in it, I was laughing like honestly, creasing with. Um, you know what I mean. <laughs> incident that um, happened, um, I didn't intend it to happen, but sort of backfired on me, but it always makes me laugh. At the time, it made me want to cry, but I was um, a little bit overweight for, um, I had to be 45 kilograms in the NABC finals, and I went in the gym on the night before, I think it was, the night before we were leaving, um, and I was three pound over. My trainer was going, that's absolutely nuts. He's going, just going, wiping the floor with me, telling me off and really, really having a go at me. Like, you know, saying I wasted the club's time. I wasted his time. The British finals tomorrow, should have more respect. You're three pound overweight. But before we entered the championships, I was like um, 
probably 48 kilos. He made me come down three kilos. Just so six months later, it's killing me through the weight. I couldn't do it. I was on my way to the gym and um, I passed the corner shop at the end of my street and I just had to go in there and I bought this can of Diet Coke and it was just went down. It was just heaven. Walked in the gym and I've gone on scales and I'm three pounds over. So he's going crazy with me. So he said, that, that, that's it. I'm, you're gonna, there's a sauna place on the corner. I'll take you there. Now, we, I knew when everyone else knew it was a massage parlor. Right? I think, oh my God, what, what's he doing? What's he doing? So he's, what, he's gone away, you know, about 20 minutes, come back. He said, right, I've had a word with the girl over there. I give it a couple of quid. You can go in and have a sauna. Get in there, sit down, and just get, get a sweat on. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, don't get yeah, me. Get over there now. Oh, Jesus Christ. I've walked in through the door. As I've walked into the door, the girl behind the counter lives back to back with me. I didn't know she was working in there. And she's obviously doing the massages. She's behind the counter. So she looked at me. I looked at her. I thought, oh, my God. She said, oh, it's all right. I just had to work with your trade. I going to use a sauna. I've gone sat in the sauna. I've been there about 10, 15 minutes now. And all of a sudden, I'm busting to pee. But I'm looking for the little window. And my trainer's up at the cash desk talking to or chatting up the girl on the till. So I can't go out to go to the toilet because he monitored everything. If I went to the toilet, he'd have said, you've been lying to me, you've been drinking. There's no way you could want to pee now if you've been sweating and you've been drinking. So you've been drinking, what have you drunk? So I thought I had to hide it somewhere. No, so I'm sat in the sauna and it's killing me. Absolutely killing me. I thought, oh my God, I gotta go look for the window again. He's still there. I can't, op can't open the door to go to the toilet. And I'm just busting on the floor. There's this big um, wooden bowl with a ladle in it, a little bit of water. Oh, God, oh, Jesus Christ. So I picked it up really, really close so you couldn't hear anything splashing. And I pissed into this pool. Put the pool back on the floor and just sat there. Like, oh, God, it was heaven. Because it was, I was having pain in my stomach, knocks in my stomach. <laughs> a few minutes goes by, the trainer's knocking on the window. He says, put the water on the coals. So I've heard him clearly. I know exactly what he means. I said, Pardon? He said, put the water on the coals. So I pointed something out and said, no, there, put, put the fucking water on the coals. I thought, oh, Jesus Christ, I can't do this. I looked at him, I said, on there now. He said, fuck it, are you fucking sure? Put that water on there now. I said, okay. So he walked, he's walked away, I put the legal in, put the legal on, now these coals are hot, you have to turn up this on, like, you know. I put this, um, big uh, label full of hot piss onto these coals. I'm stuck in this room. I never smelled anything like, I was totally dehydrated. My, my, my piss was orange. I poured it onto these coals. Oh my God. I never, I never smelled or experienced anything like it. It was absolutely chronic. Oh my God. I was, I've cried once I've laughed so many times since, but at the time, oh, it was painful. Really painful. It backfired on me. Uh... That's brilliant. <laughs> oh, what a situation to be in. Like, oh, that is, I'm not surprised it stayed with you. That, that, is, uh, that is something, Tony. Um, but I think we've covered everything. I mean, before we wrap it up, is there anything specific that you'd like to say to sort of anyone watching this? Um, anything at all that comes to mind or, or are you sort of all good with everything? Uh, just to mention, if any of the boxes, out, any boxes out there have any injuries, they can give us a ring. And we've got the CBD boxes bam now available. It's normally £20, £15 on offer at the moment. Um, and it's, it's excellent, absolutely excellent for uh, repairing um, injuries to, uh, you know, the muscles um, immediately. Like, you know, it's, it's a really quick um, repair system. Like, you know, it really is working really well. It was £20, it was 20 pounds, which is on offer at the moment, the £15 a time. And it's perfect for both sports and non-sports people. And the benefits are very quick repair to the muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Um, repairs them as soon as uh, two to three days. It's full spectrum CBD infused into a cream to give instant relief. Well, um, like I said before, I mean, I appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with me, Tony, because I, obviously I know you're, you're always busy and I know we've, you know we've all got a bit more time at the moment, but I still I do appreciate you taking the time. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there will be more videos coming soon.